Sailors are famous for their love of whiskey, grog, and beer. When away at sea for months or years at a time, surrounded by nothing but salt water, imbibing alcohol seemed to fill a void and help men pass the time. Whiskey played a, an absolutely central part in American history up through the 19th century. It defined how people went about their daily lives. Well, alcohol and sailors have a long, long tradition. Going back to the early days of sail, of course, it turned out that uh, beverages with alcohol, mead, wine, rum, beer, uh, all had much greater staying power on those long journeys at sea. The men of the USS Monitor drank coffee before the Battle of Hampton Roads. But during the battle itself, Captain John L. Warden ordered Paymaster William F. Keeler, a teetotaler, to give each man half a gill of whiskey. If liquor ever does good to anyone and is ever useful, it must be on some such occasion. William F. Keeler. In July 1862, the U.S. Congress passed an act banning spiritus liquor on board Union vessels, unless for medicinal purposes. The ban would take effect on the 1st of September. No additional liquor would be allowed aboard ships after that date, so some ship's commanders loaded their ships with as much whiskey as they could. The commander of the Monitor ordered three 40-gallon barrels to have on board. One sailor remarked, That is enough to last us one year. Most of the men on board the Monitor were unhappy with this new law, but at least one liked it. There are three great evils in both our Army and Navy which, if corrected, would render them much more efficient. The first is whiskey, the second is whiskey, and the third is whiskey. William Keeler may have been onto something. A sketch artist from Harper's Weekly captured a humorous scene in the Union Army. A drunken soldier being punished in camp by having to wear a barrel painted with the words, too fond of whiskey. A crowd gathers around the poor fellow whose head pokes out of the top of the barrel. One clever comrade doffs his cap and greets the convict saying, how are you, Monitor? While another onlooker jokes, where's the Merrimack? The editors of Harper's opined, thus accoutred, the miserable fellow is the butt of the scoffs and jeers of his comrades for a day and learns a lesson which ought to teach him the virtue of temperance for the rest of his life. Unlike Keeler, most sailors were probably angry about their lost whiskey ration. It is a miserable law, and our wise men in Congress had better devote their time to matters of more importance. George White, third assistant engineer, USS Monitor. The daily grog ration was often the high point of a sailor's day. It was a bright spot in the monotony of shipboard life. Sailors considered it their right. It was a dark day indeed when Secretary of the Navy Gideon Wells issued a general order outlawing distilled liquors on board Union vessels. Now the order was to take effect on the 1st of September, 1862. So perhaps the importance of grog to the men can be summed up best by this anonymous poem written the day before, the 31st of August, 1862. It goes like this. Oh, messmates, pass the bottle around. Our time is short, remember. For our grog must stop, our spirits drop on the first day of September. Although their grog ration was gone, sailors on the Monitor and other Union ships likely found other ways to get their fix. Bottles of hair tonic and bitters found on the wreck of the Monitor may be examples of attempts to circumvent this ruling. And, of course, nothing could stop sailors from drinking when they went ashore. On Christmas Day, 1862, some of the crew of the Monitor had leave to go ashore at Hampton Roads, where they encountered the crew of four British vessels that were in port. Initially, the men mingled together and seemed to get along well, but soon things took a turn for the worst. The parties got too much whiskey, and a fight would have to decide who was the best man of the two. There seemed to be a sort of general mass, black eyes, bloody noses, and battered faces seeming to predominate. The soldiers running here and there, and the guards busy carrying drunken fighting soldiers off to the lockup in the Fortress Monroe. William F. Keeler. One of the most notorious drinkers on the Monitor was Lawrence Murray, a 34-year-old New Yorker who stood 5 feet 6 inches tall, with blue eyes, a fair complexion, and a bald head. Murray served as a steward aboard the vessel. Unfortunately, he was a drunkard, and he had keys to the wardroom storeroom where the liquor was kept. 
In March 1862, Murray was responsible to serve a meal aboard the Monitor to officers and other dignitaries. Unfortunately, he was drunk. I suppose he had been testing the brandy and champagne before putting it upon the table. As may be supposed, it was a decided failure. The fish was brought in before we had finished the soup, and champagne glasses were furnished us to drink our brandy from, and vice versa. Murray yelled and begged for mercy. He was embarrassed, but the next morning, he went into the storeroom and got drunk again. And for that, he got locked up. In September 1862, after the ban on the grog ration went into effect, Murray went ashore at Hampton Roads and got drunk. Upon returning to the Monitor, he seized an axe and tried to kill the paymaster's steward. In the evening, we had a melancholy exhibition with the effects of whiskey. Our wardroom steward had been allowed liberty ashore, and of course must come back drunk. His first act after getting aboard was to seize an axe and try to split my boy's head open. The usual punishment in such cases was resorted to. He was put in double irons, his hands being confined behind him. In this condition, he managed to get to the side and jumped overboard. Being so heavily ironed, of course, there was no chance for him, and he never rose. It is unclear whether Murray jumped or fell overboard. Either way, his body wasn't recovered for several days. One of the first beers we made was Short Fuse, uh, which tells the stories of Lawrence Murray and his temper and how that got him in trouble. In fact, the Monitor and Virginia have inspired liquor producers for more than a century. In the 1890s, J.C. Childs and Company advertised Monitor Blend Pure Rye Whiskey as a scientifically blended and excellent product of the still that has medicinal and tonic virtues. In a major ad campaign in 1912, the Duffy Malt Whiskey Company of Rochester, New York used a 72-year-old union nurse as their spokesperson. She claimed that her doctor had recommended drinking whiskey to improve her memory. And now, she said, I can remember things that happened as far back as the Battle of Hampton Roads between the Monitor and the Merrimack. Duffy ran this ad in newspapers from Boston to New Orleans and from Baltimore to San Francisco and everywhere in between. Recently, the Hampton Roads area of Virginia has seen a renewed interest in the Monitor's connection to sailors' favorite libations. Uh, when we first opened the brewery, we were challenged by uh, the Fort Monroe Authority to come up with a name that um, was historically significant to the fort, so that way we could tell a story of the fort, but also, um, you know, sell some good beer alongside with it. As we settled on the name Oozel Finch and we started researching more of the history here on Fort Monroe, we just fell more in love with it, and we wanted to tell that story more than just through the name of the brewery, but also through the beers that we made. We have a beer called Oxcart. That was uh, from the story of Charlotte White, um, who used to pack her oxen car full of pies and bring them on the base and sell them to the soldiers. We have also named some beers uh, after uh, Benjamin Butler, who, uh, uh, who was a general here um, on uh, Fort Monroe. We had the opportunity to go into the Casemate Museum and harvest some yeast from uh, his Tiffany & Co. dinner chest that, that uh, he had with him. Uh, our chemist swabbed the, swabbed the chest and was able to pull a, a living uh, yeast cell off of uh, the lock that was on the chest. Um, she cultivated it up, grew it, and uh, we're on our third beer with it now. We went kind of more from just telling stories with, with the beers to also being able to drink a piece of history. In addition to Oozel Finch, the Ironclad Distillery opened in Newport News in 2015 in a historic warehouse within view of the old historic battle site between the World War I Victory Arch and Newport News City Hall. We started the distillery in 2015. It's me, my brother, and my dad, so it's a family-run business, and we have committed to only making bourbon. So we have um, five expressions of bourbon right now, and we named ourselves Ironclad because we would have actually had a front row seat to the Battle of the Ironclads in 1862 if this distillery was standing on that day. So we like to tell that story through our products and in our tasting room and in our distillery. So if you actually take one of our bottles and peel the label back, um, it reveals the blueprint of the USS Monitor on our flagship small batch bourbon. Um, and then if you take our straight bourbon and peel the label back, it reveals the CSS Virginia. So you get a little history with your whiskey here at Ironclad. To learn more about the Ironclad vessel that has inspired libations for more than a century, order Our Little Monitor, The Greatest Invention of the Civil War, by Anna Gibson Holloway and Jonathan W. White, published by Kent State University Press in 2018.
Oh, messmates, pass the bottle around. Our time is short, remember, for our grog must stop, our spirits drop on the first day of September. Farewell, old rye, tis a sad, sad word, but alas, it must be spoken. The ruby cup must be given up and the demijohn be broken. Jack's happy days will soon be past to return again, no, never, for they've raised his pay five cents a day and stopped his grog forever.